doctrine, I personally, if I'm going to walk with God, I'm going to have to separate from these things. And then two would be ecclesiastical, meaning as a church body, which the church is the, the believers, it's not just, it's not the building necessarily, it's just, it's the believers. We as, 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 a, as a unified body of believers, we should, uh, as a church, separate from uh, not only that which is sinful, but obviously bad doctrine. And uh, the intent with the, the history lesson here that we have, uh, following the outline, is that um, separation also uh, helps maintain the church uh, pure, and it keeps the its practice basically uh, biblical. Um, there's lots of things that would violate autonomy. Uh, autonomy is going to be something that we're going to be covering next week and probably a little bit after that as well. Um, but uh, as a church, uh, anything that would violate our self-governing is going to be something that we should separate from. And so you have uh, independent organizations that are out there that are um, seeking either to lord over their authority over the local church or um, maybe they don't seek it uh, actively but nevertheless they end up violating um, I'll get a little bit more specific here when we get into the history lesson as far as how this pertains and what how this applies to us today um, but as a church we shouldn't uh, have an authority outside of just the Bible and the Lord Jesus Christ governing us as far as the decisions that we make here. We don't have um, a home office that we um, report to that gives us orders as far as what we should do, you know, where we should go, uh, what a person should preach, and those kinds of things. Um, we have that from just the Bible and from the Lord Jesus himself and from the Holy Spirit guiding through the leadership in the local church here being the pastor. And then... Um, we also don't have a fellowship, uh, a camp, a college, or any other kind of outside organization that controls us because we're supposed to, we're supposed to be independent. We're supposed to be uh, seeking to do um, what we're told to do in the scripture as far as the church is concerned, which is reach the lost and then edify them and make disciples out of them, basically. So and then... Um, we don't, you know, we can't be about our business if we have somebody else governing us. That's what, it, that's basically what it comes down to. What we're going to see here with the history lesson is, um, a number of things primarily, uh, that are going to be recurring themes. Um, and it seems like we're, we're probably going to beat a dead horse, but it's not, it's not that so much as that. Uh, these are things that if we're not aware of, if we're not careful about in, in, in guarding us, not just personally, but also as a, as a local body here, that uh, we can fall into the same kind of traps and the same kind of uh, sins and mistakes that these, these folks did in the past. Um, we come up with, first part of the history is uh, Baptists of England. Um, we read here, Origins of the 17th Century. Two groups of English Baptists, General Baptists and Particular Baptists, arose from two separate origins. The names come from the views of each group regarding the atonement, or basically regarding salvation. General Baptists held to a general atonement, and a Particular Baptist held to a particular atonement of the elect. They also differed over some matters of church organization. Basically, what that comes down to is your General Baptist. They're going to be Calvinistic, but they're not... Uh, the one, the particular Baptists are basically, they're the Calvinists, and the General Baptists would be more, I guess you could say, free will. That's that's going to be an argument that if we ever read, if anybody ever reads much on Baptist history or even just church history a lot, that you'll see that um, arising Calvinism stems before Calvin and the Reformation. It just got systematized during that time. The philosophy actually goes back to origin in very early hundreds. Um, Augustine, I'm sorry. In Augustine. <laughs> uh, 
Um, the particular Baptists are going to be the Calvinists. They're going to be the ones that say that Jesus died for some people and he arbitrarily picks people to go to heaven and hell. Um, so your general Baptists here... Um, I'm going to beg to differ a little bit with this, um, as with the article here. Um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you in a moment why it says, uh, regarding the General Baptists, a group of Puritans called Separatists because they believe in separation of church and state met at Gainsborough, England in the early 1600s when the congregation became too large to meet in one place. The group divided. A part of them uh, began to meet because um, this is what would happen uh, in Zurich and uh, Bern and uh, good large parts of Europe and Germany when you had uh, the Lutherans in charge or when you had the Presbyterians in charge they did as the same as the Catholics because they maintained the same structure because that's what they came out of so that's what they, they remained to because they were just trying to reform it and so what they did was if you don't believe like we do and if you don't uh, adhere to you know your your loyalties to the state church then you know we'll kill you we'll brown, uh, drown you we'll imprison you we'll tax you uh, we'll do a, whatever we want because if you're not for us then you're against us and so separation of church and state was originally intended for the purpose of being able to freely worship and so um, Again, this falls not only just under autonomy, but this also falls under individual soul liberty. Um, throughout Scripture, um, when God calls for a person to believe on Him, and when God calls for a person to repent, uh, when God calls for somebody to do anything, um, even though by reason of nature, we're obligated to do so uh, because he is God. Um, the thing is, uh, he appeals to the will. And so although he has every right, because he is God, to be a um, judge over us and to kill us, to strike us down, to punish us for, you know, for our wrong and you know, for not adhering to him, the fact is, it's still appeal to the will. And so the thing is, he doesn't force us to believe on him. He doesn't force anybody to do anything. He doesn't force uh, anybody to love him. He doesn't force anybody to obey his will. He doesn't force anybody to get saved. He doesn't force anything on anybody. Now, he will make strong appeal. <laughs> he will make it very difficult for you not to want to. But the thing is, the uh, fact of the matter is, God doesn't force anybody to do anything. He appeals to the will. And so the thing is, uh, if a person wants to reject Christ, as foolish as that is, they're free to do so. If a person doesn't want to believe uh, God's commandments, if a person wants to reject God, if a person wants to reject God's teachings, the fact of the matter is, they are free to do so. I mean, there are consequences and there is judgment that falls as a result of that. Uh, but the thing is, no one... Uh, is forced to by God. And so the thing is, we have a free will, and we have uh, the liberty to be wrong. We have the liberty to be foolish and stupid in our decision-making. We have, basically, the, the liberty to, to reject truth. I mean, it's foolish to reject truth, but the fact of the matter is, we're, we're free to be able to do so. And so... Um, God, um, God intended that to be um, a governing practice. And so what happened was, not just during the Reformation time, but prior to the Reformation, you have a uh, Catholic church in charge. Uh, they have the, st the same practice in that um, when they're in charge, they're the boss. And if you don't believe like we do, uh, we're going to force you to believe. Uh, be honest with you, Muslims do the same thing. Uh, actually, the Mormons, to a degree, do the same thing. Just not, they don't uh, carry out physical persecution necessarily, but they do. Uh, you're not going to be able, 
you're not going to be able to work in their community if you if you're in a largely Mormon community where they run the businesses, uh, unless unless you're Mormon or unless you 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 adhere to being Mormon friendly, uh, you're not going to get work. You're not uh, probably going to be able to find a place to rent. You're not going to be able to get property. You're not going to be able to do a number of things. So to a degree, it's the same same type of uh, manner and mindset. Um, but anyways, getting back, um, these individuals um, believe in separation, separation of church and state, separation uh, church and state being that the state, the government, has no right to infringe on my ability to be able to freely worship God as I see, as I should. Uh, also, the government has no right to tell me what I should or should not believe about God, about how the church is run. They have no right to infringe on this local church, or any local church for that matter, as far as, uh, you know, what, how, how you should operate, what you should preach. And so this is uh, what this is, um, this is, I mean, that's clear Bible teaching. The thing is, this is what was the climate of the day. And this then now moving on to particular Baptist. Particular Baptists emerged from a group of independent Puritans. Uh, it says here in parentheses, independence stressing the independence of the local church, basically autonomy. And so, um, in the 1630s, under the leadership of uh, John Spilsby, uh, William Kiffin and William Jesse. Uh, Kiffin was a wealthy merchant and a great asset. Uh, to early Baptists, both because of his political uh, corrections, connections, excuse me, and his sound judgment. Uh, Benjamin Keach, pastor of the Horsley Down Church in Southwark, London, was an innovator who introduced singing of hymns to church services. Uh, previously, they had just sung psalms and encouraged the Christian education of children. Um, that's pretty interesting. Later on, you would have um, Isaac Watts, who was another one that was a big uh, big influence in why we even have a hymnal today, to be honest with you, because uh, you have the Wesleys that would later come on, and then they would write songs uh, about personal experience, personal testimony, personal walk with the Lord, and then Isaac Watts was pretty interesting. He, was, he grew up Baptist. Um, he got saved pretty early on, and the church practice at the time, as we read here, is that they would sing the Psalms. The Psalms, literally the Psalms were, it's like the hymn book of, of the Bible, the the, the Hebrew hymn book, and so uh, they would just take the psalms and then just put a tune to them. Or they would have a tune, and that's that's what that's what they would sing. They didn't really have a hymnal. They wouldn't have like songbooks. But uh, these individuals um, saw that there was a need, in particular with Isaac Watts. He <laughs> it was funny because he was uh, as a teenager uh, bored with the fact that. Uh, you know, why is it that we have to sing the Psalms? Not that there's anything wrong with the Psalms, it's just simply that this is boring. You know, there ought to be a little bit more liveliness, there ought to be a little bit more uh, to the worship experience than just singing the Psalms. And so his father challenged him, well, you know, if you think you could do something better, why don't you go out and do it? And that provoked him to be able to, well, not to be able to, that provoked him to write songs. And so a number of the hymns, that we have in our hymnal was as, as a result of the provocation of his father to, hey, do something better if you think you can. And so he did. And quite honestly, during that day, he was kind of controversial because most people didn't want to accept the fact that um, he was considered um, contemporary. That's not advocacy for what we would know today as contemporary Christian music, but just simply it was something different. It was a change in... Uh, standard order of how a church was run, and um, he was he was kind of challenged on that, so it wasn't widely accepted early on. Um, but we have the blessing today of having a number of great songs in the hymnal as a result. Um, let's see here, Baptist writings it says Baptists in 17th century England might not have suffered so much persecution if they had kept a lower profile. Instead, they published materials clarifying and defending their beliefs. Uh, John Merton, <coughs> uh, a general Baptist, wrote persecution for religion judged and condemned from prison in 1615. Uh, the London Confession of 1644, particular Baptist 
Uh, Statement of Faith is a forerunner of Baptist confessions still in use today, including the Philadelphia Confession and the, Ham the New Hampshire Confession. Uh, the confessions it was just something that the Baptists that had organized themselves into kind of conventions basically put out. This is what we believe. It's kind of it's kind of similar to what we have today as like our uh, statement of faith that we have a constitution as as an organized church, but they did it not just as their individual church, but they did it as their their particular church movement. Um, John Bunyan, a Baptist preacher who had little formal education and made his living by repairing pots and pans, was also one of the greatest literary geniuses in the history of the English language. He wrote his masterpiece, The Pilgrim's Progress, an allegory for the Christian life while in prison because he refused to stop preaching without the sanction of the state. Again, this uh, goes back to the separation of church and state. The government had to give approval of whether or not you were qualified or whether or not you can actually preach. And quite frankly, if you didn't meet up to the government standard for what they thought, you know, uh, a preacher should be or, or what's, qualifi what, what's qualifying for a preacher, then you were not government approved and you were subject to imprisonment or death or any number of other punishments. And so he suffered for at least 12 years in prison because he just wanted to obey the Bible and the call of God in his life. Um, struggle for liberty. The political situation in England complicated the Baptist struggle for liberty. At various times, the English government tried to impose strict Anglicanism or Puritanism on everyone, depending on who happened to be in power. The Baptists generally supported the Parliament in their conflict with King Charles I. Some radicals, including a few Baptists, resisted the restoration of Charles II after Oliver Cromwell's death. Most people considered these fifth monarchy meant to be dangerous revolutionaries, even though the Baptists tried to distance themselves from the radicals. The government and the general public suspected the Baptists of complicity in this movement. After years of refinement and the fires of persecution, Baptists finally gained religious toleration in 1689 with the ascension of William and Mary to the English throne. As Baptists had their first taste of freedom to worship and propagate their views, the stage was set for great advance. Sadly, they missed their chance. We're going to get into this uh, in some of what we're about to read, but the reason why that's the case is because um, previous to this, a number of the Baptists had fallen into what people refer to or commonly call Calvinism. And so Calvinism played a big factor in, I hate to say it, but in, in early Baptist history, early church history period, uh, it was a, it still is, it's a wicked doctrine, it's damnable heresy. Um, you have a lot of people that are getting trained in Bible colleges and seminaries across the country presently, and uh, even under pastors that have uh, given heed to this doctrine, that in a nutshell basically teaches God chose arbitrarily who's going to go to heaven, who's going to go to hell. So he created some people specifically that they're not going to be able to be saved because he chose them to go to hell, basically, is what it comes down to. And then you have other people. No one has a free will. Um, so you have no control over what you do because you have no free will. You know, you're going to do what you're going to do. God created you as you are. And so everything is as it is. It is what it is, and you can't do anything about it because we have no free will. We're just little puppets and robots in God's big scheme of things and his plan for whatever he's going to do in the world. Well, the Bible is very clear on you know, how foolish that is, how wicked that is. is the fact is, we have a free will. Uh, we're able to freely choose. We're able to be saved. There isn't anybody that is excluded from salvation. Uh, the Bible says that whosoever will may come. Uh, whosoever will uh, can drink of the water of life freely if they so choose. And um, Calvinism by default, if you logically follow it through, if I have no personal responsibility, not just for what I do, but I have no personal responsibility for going out to seek people to be saved, then why should I? I mean, it makes it doesn't make any sense. If people are destined to go to hell, you know, they're destined to go there. Why do I have to go after them? Why do I have to go preach the gospel to them? Why do I have to go seek them out? 
Um, and so that is a very deadening uh, mindset, and that's a very deadening thing that really killed evangelism and killed a lot of the outreach that um, was very, 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 um, there was a lot of potential for it uh, during this, this, this time. Uh, we're going to see here, um, 18th century, the General Baptist and the particular Baptist, East Fache, faced problems that prevented them from having the spiritual impact on English that they should have had. When doctrinal heresy arose, Calvinism, the, Baptist sacrifice, the General Baptist sacrificed purity for the sake of unity. In the end, they had neither purity nor unity. Uh, nor unity nor purity. The particular Baptists refused to sacrifice doctrinal purity for unity. In the end, they both had unity and purity, but they lacked soul winning zeal because they embraced, a, they embraced Calvinism, not just a deadening form. Calvinism, period, is deadening. Um, and then one Calvinist preacher who was a successor of Keach at the historic Horsley Down Church. Uh, Horsley Down Church would later become, we'll see here, it's going to be Park Street Chapel. That's where Spurgeon's going to preach, and he's going to have tons of people saved uh, during his his um, his uh, his ministry there. But it says that, uh, get, get this, the Calvinist preacher, his name was John Gill, boasted that he had preached for more than 50 years and never addressed the unconverted. Can you believe that? 50 years preaching from a pulpit and he never told people how to get saved. I mean, I don't know. To me, that's a waste of time. He uh, published a number of books. He's got a systematic theology. He was brilliant and gifted as Hebrew scholar and theologian. But, I mean, to be honest with you, what good is he, <laughs> if, he doesn't, if he doesn't believe in people getting saved? I mean, to me, I don't know, it's retarded. It's just foolish. Re New Connection, General Baptist. Revival did not come to England, but it came through the preaching of John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield. Uh, these individuals, uh, interestingly enough, does very many people know about the Wesleys here? About their history? Yes or no? Does anybody? Me? Looks like me only. Okay. Um, John and Charles Wesley were brothers, and they, they came from a very large family. They came from a good, strong Christian home. And they went into ministry, both of them, uh, as young adults, but they were both unsaved at the time. Uh, Charles would be saved first, and he would be saved. Uh, actually, they were both saved in, in, uh, in England. But they were saved under the influence of, of uh, Moravian preachers. Uh, the Moravians, quick, just quick uh, church history here. Moravians were believed basically they were independent. They, I would be hesitant to call them independent Baptists, but they would be kind of the equivalent. They were just independent believers living out in the middle of nowhere, uh, actually in the largest state in uh, in Moravia, which is kind of modern day Czechoslovakia area. Uh, real close to Poland and, and Germany. They um, had been followers of a guy named Johannes Huss, or John Huss, who had helped translate, he had translated the Bible into Czech, and he got burned at the stake for translating the Bible. And then, anyway, so he was just an independent believer, who got the Bible, read it, believed it, got saved, and taught salvation by faith. And uh, just the way they ran their church, they had a little particular things that were kind of odd, but uh, for the most part, they were they were pretty very pretty sound in their doctrine. And what had happened was you had a lot of these believers that went underground uh, during this time because there was heavy persecution by the governing powers. Most of Europe at this time were run in the same type of mindset uh, that England was run. As far as you have a state church, if you're not part of the state church, then you're you're open for persecution, and that's what would happen. So these guys would go undercover, they'd go hide out in caves out in the woods, they would just find some place that, you know, we can just live. And then um, there was a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Zinzendorf, Nicholas von Zinzendorf. He was a very wealthy individual. He gave him safe haven, and eventually what happened was uh, you had a large community of these Christians that started congregating at his place, and he made his place basically like a big... <laughs> A uh, big man house is what it came yeah. to be, but it wasn't 
exclusively men because it was it was all families, and so you had uh, a large community of believers that were living together, uh, getting refuge from the persecution around them. But the thing was, you had a lot of bickering and a lot of uh, just petty, uh, petty nonsense as far as arguments that were going on between them. And von Zinzendorf was burdened about that, and a number of the believers in the area were burdened about that. And um, he would, he was very, um, he's very devout. He's very uh, zealous for the Lord. He had a very close walk with the Lord. And within about a year, maybe a year and a half, almost two years, you had a revival break out. I mean, genuine revival where you had everybody getting right with the Lord and you had, I'd say, at least one in every two, if not one in every three. Uh, I may be wrong on those statistics, but it should be very close to that of, of that community of 300 people um, go and be foreign missionaries to literally all over the world. Um, and you had uh, individuals that would sell themselves into slavery uh, knowing that they wouldn't come back that probably wouldn't see their families again as far as uh, not, I don't mean by leaving their wife and kids I mean like they wouldn't see you know their mom or dad or anything like that they would just you know the world needs somebody to tell them about Jesus we're gonna do it we're gonna go uh, they, they didn't run around seeking support they found a trade that they can do and they said, hey, we're just going to go. We're going to support ourselves by what we can do with our hands. Uh, and they just went out, and that's what they did. They had a prayer meeting that lasted 100 years. In other words, multi-generational prayer meeting that they would pray literally 24 hours a day. They had a schedule set that you would have, say, um, say Brother Nick had the time slot of like 3 to 4 in the afternoon. And then, Brother Chuck, you would have uh, the you know the four to five in the afternoon, and then you'd have you know, Brother Chris. You had maybe like five or six in the morning, and then you'd have uh, Brother Al. You'd have the seven to eight in the morning time slot, and that's how they would just break it up per family. But they would have that unbroken for a hundred years, praying for the salvation of souls, praying for people to get called into missions, praying, praying for the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they just it was just a continual prayer meeting that lasted for over a hundred years and they had a very incredible impact in that uh, you had churches started where there hadn't been you had gospel being presented and being preached where it had not been before and you had Bible getting translated uh, whole communities were changed if you go um, up into northern Canada northeast Canada north of Newfoundland there's a little area called Labrador which is it's very isolated like basically out in the middle of nowhere, it's very hard to get to. And you have, um, I have not personally been there, but I have a first-hand testimony from our admissions professor in college that, that has been there on numerous occasions where uh, you, can, you can still even to present day see the influence. Um, communities um, that had had uh, the Moravians in there, you still have some of the churches continuing even though Many of them don't preach the gospel anymore, or many of them have a perverted view of the gospel, but you still have the influence lasting in that the communities that had had Moravian influence in there, that had the gospel preached in there, that had uh, reception of the gospel, are moral, they're usually clean, they're usually, um, you know, just good high educational standards, whereas the ones that didn't, uh, usually it's high crime rate, high suicide rate, lots of problems and issues with drugs, alcohol, and morality, and those kinds of things. And it's very evident. You can even, uh, according according to him, he told me, you can see it from, you know, within uh, 30, 40 mile just distance. It'd be, it'd, be, it'd be the same difference as saying if Fort Lauderdale took the gospel and, 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 you know, people, if it greatly, strongly impact here, but say Miami ended up rejecting it, and you can see probably a few generations down the, the consequence of that, you know, that's still increasing in wickedness, but then you would have uh, the power of the gospel having impacted here. Uh, anyways, going back, the Wesleys saved under the, the influence of these individuals, and they come and they start preaching revival, and you start seeing people getting saved, and as a result, uh, 
you know, people start getting on fire and say, hey, you know, we need to go out and we need to do this. We need to go out. We need to preach the gospel. Um, revival and missions. During this time, this is 1700s going into 1800s, we have, um, go down, we'll go down here where it says Fuller. Though still Calvin is Fuller realized that evangelism was a necessary uh, means ordained by God to save men. Um, Fuller closely associated with an individual, an individual by the name of William Carey, who was a self-educated preacher. He, t he literally, he taught himself to read and write by, when he was cobbling shoes. He taught himself Greek, Hebrew, and a number of other languages uh, while he was just cobbling shoes. Um, and then God gave Carey a vision for the world, for world missions. Um, he preached a great message out of Isaiah 54 called uh, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. Um, interesting note, when Carey preached that message, it was at a meeting of pastors in the area where he was at in London, and there was an older gentleman that was pretty well respected. Carey was just a young upstart. He was like basically a nobody. He's just somebody that's very zealous, a very young Christian. Uh, he's, he's, he's grown in the Lord. He's matured in the Lord, but as far as he's, he's kind of young age-wise, he doesn't have, really have a whole lot of experience, but he does know God, and he's got a vision from God as far as what needs to be done. And just from Scripture, we need to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. And there was an individual in this meeting stands up and tells Carrie, while he's preaching, sit down, young man, sit down. When God wants to save the heathen, he'll do it without your help or mine. And then, <laughs> that's pretty interesting. But that was... That was, uh, that was still the climate of the day. And so what Carey did was he went out, uh, he was underfunded, and he ended up having a work job. He had a lot of hardship. He lost a number of his children. He lost, uh, actually he was married uh, three times over, but he lost his first wife. She went insane after she, she, uh, she lost her youngest son uh, due to uh, illness out in India. But through him, the Lord used him to be able to translate um, 30, uh, the, the Bible into at least 30 different Indian languages. And he was basically the, the impetus for Baptist missions in, in England. Um, we're not going to have time for all these individuals I wanted to name. Uh, men of significance here to the U.S. with regard to this time uh, would be just this is just a little bit prior Isaac Backus, John Leland. John Leland actually is responsible for getting the Bill of Rights instituted into 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 the Constitution. Um, what had happened was he was uh, a very uh, prominent, well-respected. Uh, pastor in Virginia. He was originally from Massachusetts, but he moved down to Virginia, preached in Virginia. Virginia at that time was Anglican rule, and so Baptists were being um, persecuted left and right. So you can you can go to jail and be killed just for preaching the gospel, because you know the government says that if you're not Anglican, if you don't adhere to us, if you don't follow by our approval standards, we'll take you out. So that's what they would do. During this time, this is during the Revolutionary War, and then after the fact, um, what John Leland did was, uh, actually what happened was Quincy Adams came to him and asked him, because he was very influential in, in, uh, in Virginia, and Quincy, Quin, uh, John uh, Quincy Adams had asked him if he can get his support so he could win the election. And um, John Leland told him, I'll do nothing. I'll actually tell everybody to vote against you unless you pull the Bill of Rights into the, in, into the Constitution. So he, uh, that's why we have it, is because of John Leland's influence. Shubal Stearns, Daniel Marshall, uh, two guys that had a great impact in the South here. 
Uh, as a result of them, the South is the way it is presently. It's not necessarily, I don't mean about racism and that kind of stuff, but I mean like simply the fact that it's known as the Bible Belt is because they came down, they preached, revival broke out, and hundreds of churches were started as a result of their personal influence and their personal work. Uh, and we have Baptist churches still today in existence, and we still have their influence today in the South as far as the Bible Belt is concerned because of their preaching. Judson, Adoniram Judson, he's a very interesting individual, and in Luther Rice. This was the first uh, Baptist missionary from the U.S. Uh, who he was, was he was actually congregational from New England. He got saved, and then on his way out to India, because he originally wanted to go to India, he ended up in Burma, and he translated the Bible to Burmese, and uh, he would say out there he would lose, I think, like five kids, and then he would lose two wives, and then he died in his third wife. But um, he, he paid, he paid a, a great price as far as to be able to get the gospel to Burma, which they have a great influence of um, Christianity. Believe it or not, they do. And Baptist history as a result of him in particular, uh, particularly in the northwest corner, in the Chin Hills, uh, with the Karen tribes. He uh, was responsible, actually Luther Rice through him was responsible in large part for uh, getting Baptist associations for missions and getting uh, Southern Baptists together for sending out missionaries. Um, we're about out of time, but we're going to cover coming up on uh, not just the different denominations and then also how the different fellowships and uh, those organizations got started and their impact and their influence on us and then how that is violating scripture here. Uh, but for today's lesson, just to recap, separation, why was it important? We see, I just wanted to point out with the history, when guys saw that something was wrong, instead of trying to reform it, clean it up, wash it up or whatever, they just said, hey, we're gonna follow the Bible we're going to pull out, we're going to separate. And so they separated. And the ones that didn't, they were gravely affected. Other thing too, um, missions, evangelism, church planning um, could have gone a lot further had people stuck to the Bible and not believed in <coughs> Calvinism. And so we had the uh, influence of Calvinism on Christianity which greatly infected it, really did a lot of damage, and really hindered a lot of what God wanted to do during this period of time. If people would have just, as we're told here, separate from bad doctrine, or if they would have like separated simply altogether and said, hey, look, we're just going to follow the Bible. We're not going to be a part of a group or organization, even though you guys have influence, and even though you guys can help us out with money. Um, we're not going to we're not going to bow down and call out to these things because we got to be pure. We got to remain to the Bible. We got to be um, you know, believers, we're either going to be obedient and be blessed, or we're going to be disobedient and we're going to suffer the consequences for it. Even though we might not immediately see it, our children, and today a lot of churches are infected with wicked doctrine as a result. So we'll go and pray and then we'll be dismissed. Yeah. Father, thank you for this day. I pray, Lord, that uh, you just uh, be with us this morning. Lord, I pray that uh, fill Pastor Price with your spirit and help him to <coughs> Uh, not just preach with power, Lord, but also just uh, that we leave here uh, fed, equipped, uh, charged, and, uh, Lord, need to be rebuked, and, Lord, shown who we are in light of who you are, and, Lord, that uh, we walk away uh, with great appreciation and uh, great love for you and for your holiness. Praise in your son's name.